My name is uh, Bassam Haddad. I am uh, a, an associate professor at CHAR, and uh, I am very happy that we are holding the second yearly uh, event of the sort, which actually addresses our faculty's trips abroad and uh, addresses their uh, analytical and other empirical observations. This is something that we do because a lot of us cannot basically travel everywhere especially given the number of countries that will be featured today. So we try to bring those places to our community here at George Mason. Uh, we have a fantastic lineup of people that uh, have been away this summer at some point, and I would love to introduce them more uh, thoroughly. We actually uh, will have uh, all details of this event on the website, minus uh, the people that tell us they don't want to actually be featured. Uh, for whatever reason, and we're happy to do that. We have with us uh, Mark Katz, uh, professors, all professors, but I'm not gonna do the professor thing. If you object, please raise your hand, and I will call you <laughs> professor. Okay, <laughs> so we have professors. Mark Katz, Tonya Neves, Ellen Beth Leibson, um, Marielle Lopez Santana, Jo Marie Bird, and myself, and we are addressing uh, a number of countries and cities and places that we uh, have been to. We will uh, be uh, recording this event and we will be sharing the reporting with everyone. We are also uh, very lucky to have with us a uh, special person who will make an announcement that relates actually to our event, uh, Professor Buzz McVeigh. <laughs> Wish I was a professor. No. <laughs> I am, uh, thanks for the promotion. <laughs> I appreciate well, yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm the communications manager of the Shar School. And back in May, I, I sent a note out to faculty and I said, tell me what you're gonna do uh, this summer on a professional basis. Not where you're gonna go for vacation, but we're just interested in, in where we're gonna go, right? And I thought I'd get three or four people to respond and I'd do a little uh, uh, tweet it out maybe, right? Well, guess what? <laughs> 26 professors visited 22 different countries, including dozens of destinations in the US. They delivered papers, sat on panels, conducted research, taught classes, led tours of students, and squeezed in a bit of sightseeing. The Shar School of Policy and Government was represented from California to Boston, to South Korea, to Kakistan, to Norway, and the Gobi Desert. And that was just one summer. And now that puts it into context, and you're going to hear some of the highlights from uh, what they did. Thank you, Bassam, for the opportunity. Thank you. And now please allow me to uh, introduce uh, Professor Mark Katz, who will be addressing uh, discontent in Britain around Brexit and beyond. All right, well. Help me welcome. Okay. Thanks very much. Would you prefer that we stand or sit? It's really or? up to you. It's a so free is it okay if I wander around? That, no, that's it's all right. Better, very right? good. Okay, that's what I'm, I'm usually doing. All right, so um, this summer, uh, well, actually in September, I did go to uh, Britain, to uh, Durham University, to uh, a conference there. But actually, I'd like to talk about sort of my last half dozen visits to the UK. Three just prior to the vote on Brexit, uh, um, our daughter uh, was a, a student at the School of Oriental and African Studies, and of course we had to go visit her. So in September 2015, January 2016, and uh, May, June 2016, it was all prior to the Brexit vote. And then I was there again on three occasions. Uh, I was a SOAS, a, a Fulbright Scholar at SOAS in early 2018. Then I was um, uh, the 2018 Sir William Luce Fellow at Durham University. And I guess they liked me because they invited me back this past September. And I think to me what was, what was fascinating about the period before Brexit was that almost all of the people whom I spoke with 
were convinced that Brexit had no chance of passing. In other words, it had no, it, it, it didn't seem to make any sense. In other words, Britain's being part of the European Union was a good thing for Britain. And that to not be part of the European Union would obviously it, you know, hurt trade, hurt uh, flows of people. And in fact, that, you know, that yes, there were some people who were not happy with the uh, uh, migrant labor. But quite frankly, an awful lot of the migrants who had come over to the UK were doing jobs that Britons themselves simply did not want to do. And so in fact, it, it wasn't such a terrible thing at all. There was only one group of people who predicted that Brexit would pass, and these were the London taxi drivers. Uh, and if you've ever been in a London taxi, you know, these guys are, are very talkative, highly opinionated, and really pretty, pretty conservative. And they basically, you know, would, would, uh, would tell us about, you know, just how uh, awful things were, that, you know, life in London was getting, you know, more and more and more expensive. And it was partly because of all these foreigners who were there that the, you know, the price of housing was just through the roof, that the opponents of, of Brexit all warned that if, if Brexit passed, property values would fall. And that, and that for, as far as the taxi drivers were concerned, that would be a good thing that if, if property values fell, because maybe they'd finally get a chance to get you know, involved you know, to, to, to do something or other. And of course, they were complaining about overregulation. And, and I guess an awful lot of this came from Boris Johnson's columns, that, there's, that they were all going <coughs> on about the overregulation of cucumbers. And then there was one, one young man who was really concerned about the overregulation of e-cigarettes. This was, I mean, this was like really passionate for him that, you know, how dare Brussels you know, regulate his e-cigarettes. This was a terrible, terrible thing. But it did seem like it was going to go anywhere, at least, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, sort of, you know, polls seemed to indicate that it was going to, you know, be rejected by a small majority. But as we all know, Brexit passed. And certainly the mood changed dramatically uh, in, in my three visits there after Brexit. That's sort of the, the people whom I knew who just became, were just incredibly depressed. They didn't understand how something so terribly irrational could happen. And, and a lot of them likened it to the phenomenon of, of Trump being elected here in the United States. That's sort of, you know, all the nice people <laughs> never thought that it could happen. But they actually thought it was worse than Trump. Because at a certain point, Trump will go away, whereas they felt that Brexit <laughs> would be forever. That if, that if they actually left the European Union, then that would be that. And that, that would not be a good thing uh, whatsoever. What, what what fascinated me was that there were articles about how um, something like 10% of the British population qualifies for an Irish passport, and that applications for Irish passports had just like just mushroomed, grew so quickly and so fast that in fact the Irish government, which doesn't usually get so many applications <laughs> for its passports, was was simply overwhelmed, and you know the sort of there were you know delays in processing these, uh, but that the the um, you know that that just like anything to be part of to remain, if, if not as a country part of Europe, as an individual, as a family, one could still sort of have this European bolt hole, if you will. Uh, but of course, there were, you know, it wasn't just Brexit wasn't the only thing. And maybe if we could show some of these uh, uh, images that I got. So when I was at, at SOAS in March of 2018, there was an academic strike. And it has real lessons for here in the United States that, that the British professoriate is so well organized yeah. that they can, in fact, put on strikes that have real bite. And over a, the course of four weeks, what happened, it was, it was about the pension scheme. And essentially, it, the, uh, that the idea was that the universities wanted to change the scheme from essentially a you know, defined benefit scheme to a defined contribution, like here in the United States, that you know, many of us here at George Mason uh, have this. And for a lot of British academics, this was just a step too far. And so what happened was that in week one, 
there was a one-day strike. No classes were taught. Week two, two days strike. Week three, three days strike. Week four, four days. And week five, all five days that, that, that there were you know, no classes taught. And it, it was just absolutely amazing. And then they threatened to do it all over again. And then finally, the powers that be back down, at least to some extent. Uh, and so here were some of the signs. You know, our pension acts support our strike. I forgot what U.S. says. Strike long and prosper. I <laughs> thought that was sort of you know, cute, sort of cultural appropriation. But anyway, can we have the next one as well? And this was, this was the front entrance for the School of Oriental and African Studies. Now, apparently at most universities, the strike, in other words, would focus on the administration building, but that you know, other buildings, people could go in and out of fairly easily. If you're at all familiar with SOAS, what you know is that this is the only entrance. <laughs> and that what happened was that basically you couldn't get in without uh, a real argument. In fact, there was, there was actually some violence uh, involved. It was, it was a pretty ugly sort of situation. And so here we are, and, 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 and the, you know, the professors were obviously passionate. What was interesting was that, that at SOAS, most of the students came out on the side of the professors. It's a, it's a school that loves to strike, that's for sure. We had our own little local strikes over local issues as well. So we can move on to the next one. Oh, there wasn't that little film or video? No. Oh, the National Health Service? Huh, that was it. That's too bad. Okay, well, uh, in any event, in addition. Okay, great, great. Uh, in addition, I think it was in March of 2018, that we just happened along on the Tottenham Court Road, there was a strike about the National Health Service, and there were literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people marching along and you know we were handed flyers as they walked past and one of the flyers that i'll never forget was do not americanize our national health service mm. you know that this was what they were afraid of was that they were going to get the american system uh, uh, for themselves and they were very very fearful and, and it's not and this wasn't just you know professors this was you know, sort of, you know, a very general population, you know, with their little local flags or where they were from, what little town or village or something like this. It was really quite um, remarkable. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Right. <laughs> anyway, this what what you see in the in the few seconds of this clip was essentially went on for hours and hours and hours. In other words, that that the number of people who were there was absolutely uh, extraordinary. <laughs> anyway, there that's just so, sort of a, <laughs> a taste of it all. And, and, and needless to say, there was no crossing that street. There you go. OK, we've had enough of that, I guess. So, uh, <laughs> so, so this was happening as, as well. And, and you know, when I went up to Durham, I mean, certainly the professors, you know, who, you know, they felt victorious because of the academic strike. And unlike in London, they had been out in the snow striking, but that they, they, they held firm. One interesting footnote was that not all universities went on strike. The London School of Economics yeah. did not. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, when I was there this last time, what, what people are saying, I mean, people who, are, who oppose Brexit are so depressed that they feel that with Britain will leave the European Union, that Scotland, which had voted to, you know, f for Remain, 
will leave Britain. And, and, and one professor even said, and then Britain will have to give up its uh, permanent membership in the Security Council. And I said, well, hold on. When the Soviet Union broke up, Russia didn't give up its seat. Is, isn't this similar? No, no, that's different. Somehow it was different. But in any event, they are, they are fearing the worst. But of course, any of you who've been watching the parliamentary debates, there was just an enormous demonstration outside of Parliament in favor of remaining. Just one last uh, anecdote. When I was at Durham, uh, we had a lecture from a uh, member of the House of Lords, a labor lord, the Lord Adonis. <laughs> That's his real name, <laughs> apparently. Uh, the Lord Adonis spoke to us, and he predicted that even if Britain leaves the EU, within five to 10 years, it'll be back in because it just makes no sense for it to be out. But that remains to be seen. And I'm getting the signal to sit down. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Professor Jonia Neves. I'm sorry, I just had a bite of something. No, you go right ahead. I thought your anecdote was going to go a little longer. Oh. I thought you were going to go a little longer. Oh, I see. I can go longer. Yeah, sure. Professor Tonya Neves will address uh, cultural perspectives from Croatia, and we also and have uh, yeah. not too many pictures, but we have something. Yeah. So I'm Tonya Neves. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Croatia. Uh, this is a unique relationship that my former university, where I also went to school, Mississippi State University, started with the University of Zagreb. It was born out of a model UN program at the undergraduate level because we needed an ambassador to, to come and put on a high school conference. We had some connections to the University of Catania and other institutions around the world, but nothing super formalized. So when we secured uh, Amir Muharami, he found out about some of our activities that were ongoing in Italy and, and, and other parts of Europe and decided that this is a great opportunity for Croatia to start being connected to more American-based universities. That was in 2007. As he's sitting with us, he makes some hand gestures to our Italian professor and essentially says, the Adriatic waters are so beautiful, they wash up the side of Croatia and take all of our sewage down the side of Italy, and that's why Croatia has the most beautiful beaches in the world. That was quite the opening line of uh, what has been a productive relationship ever since. Um, when we think about Croatia, prior to the Game of Thrones phenomenon, I know most of you think that winter is coming, but we all know with that last season, it died a slow death. Uh, so when I left Mississippi State, I decided to come to Mason and, and continue that partnership, that collaborative spirit. But it was a little bit unique at Mississippi State because we didn't do it in terms of a study abroad. We actually partnered with the University of Zagreb, the University of Split, Vern Institute, and the Center for Advanced Academic Studies. And what we did is we tried to put on a workshop every summer June, July, of uh, postdoctoral researchers, uh, younger uh, PhD um, professionals, and other interested researchers to more of a symposium style activity to kind of see where we could go for collaborative uh, grants and research opportunities or to publish. Well, each institution's a little different, and so when you've got all these academics descending upon some of the most beautiful places in the world, you kind of get uh, sidetracked easily with the beauty and the, you know, the food, and you don't really get a lot of work done. So you have to go back home and, and do that. So after I left Mississippi State and came to George Mason, I thought, well, I don't know if that model would work, this advanced training seminar, this symposium style among faculty, because as Buzz mentioned, we're very actively engaged around the world already. So trying to get an interested party of Mason faculty dedicated in the summer to go to Croatia, A, should probably be easy, but B, everyone's busy. So what about the study abroad program? Is there a way to find a natural fit with our students to expose them to some of these research ideas, some of these, these partnerships, not just with you know, Croatian scholars, but also other American scholars who are also coming at the same time? And so, um, it's been going on for, I think this is the sixth year. 2020 will be the sixth iteration at Mason. Um, we still actively engage with all the institutions there. The topics change from year to year. Sometimes they're public health focused. Sometimes they're emergency management. Sometimes they are socio-political challenges, especially given that Croatia uh, is still overcoming uh, 
scars from the Yugoslavian war, which is what I really wanted to talk to you about because there is this misconception about what Croatia is and, and what it stands for today and how you know some areas around the world have a, a more difficult time with reconciliation and the post-conflict peace building process and somehow Yugoslavian nations, <laughs> former Yugoslavian nations have done a little bit better job. Um, when I first went to Zagreb and you go through the tunnels in the mountains and you see the sheer devastation of what the war did in terms of people sniping off individuals based on their license plate as they're coming through, it kind of haunts you and you want to understand more about why people can do that. Now, the Yugoslavian war, the ethnic cleansing was masked in religion. At the end of the day, it really came down to economics. When Tito died, there was a, a, a power vacuum left open and people were vying for control over money because unemployment was extremely high and access to opportunity was extremely limited. And so what better way than to do it in the name of religion? And so when I take students, especially those that have some type of Albanian background or Croat background or Serbian background or Bosnian background, when they go, they're often hesitant to share their ethnicity. And I find that, I find that interesting, but also um, cautious because they still have a very real image in their mind from when they were a child if they did escape, or their parents still have a very real image in their mind in which they've shared after escaping. But as soon as we get there, those, those fears are eliminated because it's come together. The reconciliation process really has taken hold in the roots of uh, tourism. So um, that is uh, Croatia's number one industry right now, apart from Game of Thrones. And I'll tell you a few other things about Croatia that most people may not know. Um, but y y understanding that history and being able to do a comparative analysis, and Philip and I were talking about this earlier today, how is it that this region is doing a better job in a shorter period of time than, say, some other areas in Africa or Asia or in the Middle East? And so, not that that's my area of expertise, but I do love Croatia. So, um, some things to consider is, how many of you men like to wear a necktie? None of, us None of you. None of us like well, it does cut off your circulation, so, yeah. from time to time. <laughs> Did you know the necktie was originated in Croatia? When women, when men would go off to battle, women would give their scarf to their men to put underneath their uniform in order to hold something close to their heart. And so by the time they got back from war, it become a fashionable trend to lengthen it. And so when you see Croatia, the eye is a necktie. Other interesting things is that they are plentiful in silver. So they would often decorate, especially higher up military officers' uniforms with silver buttons. When the uniforms were decommissioned, they took all the silver off, and then they would forge two buttons together to make pendants or earrings, or they'd leave them in button style and make bracelets and rings, and it's Bhutan jewelry. So if you ever go, keep that in mind. Um, how many of you know that the, the stone at the White House is what was brought in from the island of Brock outside of Split, Croatia? So there's these unique ties to American history with Croatia. Another interesting one is on the island, I mean, on the island of Vis, uh, which you can be honest, how many of you have seen Mamma Mia 2? <laughs> Mamma Mia 2 was not filmed in Greece, it was filmed on the island of Vis, Croatia. What is unique about Vis, and I'm sure Ellen knows this better than I do, is that Tito chose that island as his hub of operations into Split because of its strategic positioning in the Adriatic. If you take a tour around the island of Vis, and it's got, you know, historical World War II prominence, you'll still see a lot of uh, propellers in the water, some other artifacts that have come down, but they would carve out caverns in the side of the island in order to hide their submarines. They'd also make houses t around the outside of the island that were bunkers for their, for their, you know, cannons, which also were hidden inside of the island. And so, you know, unless you go there, you don't really ever think about the strategic importance of a little small island that everyone thinks is just beautiful and has wonderful wine. By the way, another interesting fact, Zinfandel grape is original it, to Croatia. So it died, it went away, but before it died and went away and we lost our beautiful wine, it, California picked it up and, and made it into something slightly different. So if you have a Zinfandel wine in Croatia as compared to California, it'll be greatly different. 
Um, what else did I want to let you all know? Oh, so like good fashion as most Americans, you know, I decided to be smart and um, share my DNA with Ancestry.com in order to see what I was because, you know, no one in my family kept up with any lineage. And a few years ago, I found out I am part Croat. So there is this natural affinity to the region and why I can speak the language. So, you know, in terms of my dialect fairly quickly. Um, so it's, Croatia has a long way to come, or a long way to go. Uh, but tourism and the, they're really, their run last year in the, the World Cup was also a, a great success to give them more exposure in terms of who they are and how they can play a more active role in the EU as well as NATO and to try and be a, a strategic partner to the United States and, and other Western nations in terms of uh, that part of the world for stability's sake. Because as we all know, Albania is still struggling with some things. Bosnia is doing better but still struggling with some things. And then other areas within and that part of the world. And so. Croatia would like to see itself as a, a strategic partner to help prevent other things from coming up through the Middle East and, 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 and into Western Europe. So these are the types of topics that we cover with our students and the type of partners after 10 years. Obviously, you know a lot of people if you're going to the same location over and over again. And, uh, and the more I find out uh, about my friends and colleagues in Croatia, the more I start seeing the connections back to American universities, whether it's the University of, of, of Texas, whether it's George Mason, whether it's Mississippi State, or the University of New Orleans, because there is a, a, a concentrated population of Croats living in that area as well, because some unique French connection. I'm still trying to tease that one out as well. But let's see. This next year, we're going to be focusing, again, on the socio-political challenges of Croatia overcoming uh, the war and see what the next 10 years look like in terms of their development in the region and also if they ever decide to go on the euro, which with Brexit occurring and them being a member of the EU, but they don't have, they, they don't have the, um, the same fiscal uh, policies because they're on their own currency still, but they're waiting to see if they want to go to the euro but based on what happens with Brexit and what it does to the, the value of the euro, or they may stay on the Kuna for a little while longer, even though everyone agrees in the country that the euro will actually stabilize their, their fiscal health and, and help with their economy because of the high unemployment rate. So, is that good? Thank you so Great. much. Great. Wonderful. We don't, have a, we don't have a solid policy on um, clapping before or after, so we're just going to play it by ear. <laughs> that sounds we good. We don't feel repressed, like as in clap now, you know? Like Is that my music? <laughs> oh, no, that's actually okay. the point of your... Okay, that album. sounds like something <laughs> I would play. <laughs> it's a hard take on me. <laughs> so, sorry. You actually had a few seconds left. Oh, I did? Okay, well, can I just show them? This is... So this is the top of the bell tower in Split, Croatia. Split kind of divides the coastline up into Istria, which is the other part of Croatia, and Dalmatia. So when we talk about the Dalmatian dog and all the spots, the 1,200 islands, the dog gets its name from this region because it's spotted. And so this is part of Dalmatia. This is the Split. Diocletian set his palace here because he wanted a summer home away from Italy. And so supposedly on a good, good, clear day, you can see Italy across the Adriatic from the bell tower. And so here, right out there, is a series of islands. So Brock, where the White House stone is, is to the left. Vis is behind that island. And then, you know, there's, there's I don't know all the names of them. There's just a lot. So, um, and then further down south, which everyone is probably infatuated with, is Dubrovnik, which is, you know, the big King's Landing and, and, and Game of Thrones. But uh, um, the city, they have a few other things that are filmed in Split, or before. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, now, please help me uh, welcome Professor Alan Lapson, who will be talking about um, South Korea copes with climate change. Thank you. So my topic is sort of semi-official because I was part of a Shar School delegation uh, to Mason's Korea campus uh, in May. So for two years running, we've hosted the our Korea, our colleagues in Korea have welcomed uh, Shar professors to come and produce a symposium or jointly with them 
on a topic of international security consequence. And we picked uh, climate as a climate and its international security implications, which is something that I think our students need to be uh, thinking more and more about. Uh, what was very interesting is that the Korean scholars were not quite there. We're really thinking more of more traditional environmental studies and not necessarily making the strategic leap to think of the connections between climate change and the role of you know, political military affairs, the roles of, of military and security institutions in responding to climate change. But it was still a very, um, you know, I think productive collaboration. The dean chaired a delegation that Ming Wan, uh, Todd Laporte, Andrew Light, and myself. Uh, so we all made presentations at this symposium. And um, can we see what's here? I don't know the order of the, okay. So this is a remarkable mall that is literally right across the street from the Mason Korea campus. It tells several stories. One of the stories it tells is both an Asian appreciation of natural beauty and the extraordinary economic development. Those high rises are literally in a land filled area uh, west of Seoul um, that is a new city. I mean, Incheon was an ancient, was a, is, a long, is a port that's very important in the history of the Korean War, but this is all a new town that's been built up mostly on, uh, you know, artificial, uh, you know, engineering feet. Most of those buildings are probably still empty, but they are trying to call this an international city, and the campus of Mason is co-located with three other non-Korean universities in an international university uh, spot. What I want you to appreciate just as we think about this is that um, these trees are actually artificial. <laughs> so um, that's, that's the sad truth. That's the sad truth. So what I, the, my sort of bottom line takeaway message is that Korea finds itself in a very uncomfortable position. It is a great promoter. It wants to be seen as an emerging G20 country of very modern sensibilities. It has contributed significantly to global governance when it, with respect to climate change. But at home, it actually is lagging behind or its own environmental problems are, are getting worse, not better. So um, why don't we see what the next slide is? Uh, so, okay. so. Base, so this is just to give you an, a feeling. I think that Koreans do have a very deep spiritual sense of nature and that what, we, what I was able to do in addition to our meetings in Seoul was to go down to an island off of the coast of Korea called Jeju, which is an international peace. Uh, in theory, people from North Korea and China can go to this island without visas. The Koreans are very much trying to create a peace culture on this island, but the island is also home to uh, natural, extraordinary natural beauty. It is not unlike Hawaii. It's a tropical zone island, and the Koreans have developed eco-healing and eco-tourism as part of what's available on this island. Uh, when our official meetings were over in Seoul and in Incheon, I traveled to this island with two of our uh, Mason Korea colleagues, uh, in part because there's a Peace Institute and the Korea Foundation are now located on the island of Jeju. So th just keep that image in mind while I give you a little bit more uh, texture to the discussion here. Um, as I said, I, I think that Korea does not have a very robust green political movement. Their politics, their political party organization has tended to be uh, you know, e you know, right-left about economic policies and, and foreign policy and of course very much preoccupied with the existential relationship with North Korea. So the political divide has tended to be, are you interested in reconciliation with North Korea or not? Are you deeply committed to be parting, part of the Western alliance with the US or are you looking for a more independent national security policy for Korea? So environmental issues haven't quite percolated up to being important national political issues, uh, but that may be shifting. We called on the uh, foreign ministry uh, folks, the office in the foreign ministry that deals with you know, the Paris Agreement and negoti international negotiations over climate. And the young diplomats told us that while this used to be a very small kind of obscure office in the foreign ministry, it's now a pretty interesting place for young diplomats to start their careers, that it is a way to begin to network globally and to work on an issue that I think for a younger generation will absolutely uh, become more defining of how their country uh, 
participates in the international community. Uh, we met with the parliamentary committee on environmental issues and didn't sense that that committee has a lot of clout or is particularly powerful. So, to, you know, at the national level, politicians don't seem to be uh, deeply committed, but the one thing that does get them is air quality. So what Korea is increasingly s suffering from is air pollution to the point where it's a public health hazard. Uh, many months of the year uh, in public schools, kids are not allowed to do sports outside. They're spending, they're investing a huge amount of money in indoor soccer fields and, and you know, air purifiers in public buildings. Um, and it really is now uh, hazardous for some people. The government has responded, and let me just say that Koreans tend to believe that the, f the reason they have air pollution is China's industrialization, so that the winds do blow over into Korea, and it is estimated by more independent scientists that probably 70% of the air pollution can be attributed to the winds from Mongolia and, and, and other parts of China, but the Koreans themselves are contributing because this is also a rapidly industrializing country, et cetera. So, um, so air quality is sort of the first step of how, does envir how do environmental problems affect people in their in their day-to-day -day lives is now percolating up to being a, a national political issue and people look to their leaders for what kinds of um, resource allocation and funding and uh, uh, responses will there be. The Korean government has tried to decentralize a bit, pushing some of the ministries away from Seoul to try to relieve some of the traffic congestion, which is a major contributor. There is a, a wonderful picture that I think um, that you may have seen in the announcement of um, I Love Seoul with you know, the air completely gray and visibility very poor. So they, they realize that uh, Seoul and Busan are now listed as among the most polluted cities in the world. Not as bad as Beijing and Delhi for most of the year, but climbing up there. Uh, South Korea also doesn't have any natural energy resources. It imports all of its oil, and it has been uh, uh, dependent on nuclear energy for up to 30% of its daily electricity needs. After Fukushima, the government was under a lot of pressure to rethink their nuclear policies, and the liberal government has pledged to phase out nuclear energy, but over an extremely long period of time, like over two to three decades. So most people believe that that was not a serious commitment to reduce its reliance on nuclear energy. And in the end, maybe they're hoping that the anti-nuclear sentiment will blow over and that they can resume, because as you may know, uh, South Korea is a major exporter of nuclear uh, energy reactors and probably still wants to be part of that business. But on the global governance side, um, the Koreans, not unlike Abu Dhabi, uh, countries that have a domestic environmental problem but are deeply committed to being more responsible players at the global level, um, the Koreans stepped up to the plate to fund two. The Abu Dhabi is funding Areva, the alternative energy uh, global institution. And the Koreans are funding two that sound just alike, so I'm going to make sure I get the names right. Uh, one is. Um, the Green Climate Fund, uh, which is an international financing vehicle to invest in smart climate action for developing countries and encouraging the private sector to be a partner of governments in green energy. And the other is the Global Green Growth Institute, which began as an NGO and is now an intergovernmental organization. The Koreans are very proud of the fact that they are you know, literally paying uh, to, for the operating costs of these two international institutions that also converges nicely with South Korea's commitment as an aid donor to developing countries so that climate becomes a much more dominant uh, factor in how they develop uh, aid programs in the developing world. So, um, uh, so I guess that's mostly what I want to um, leave with you. Ban Ki-moon, former Secretary General of the UN, is a South Korean. He is deeply involved. He's on the boards of most of these climate-related organizations and is also trying to promote greater citizens' awareness and greater public policy attention to climate issues. So, you know, South Korea is a really dynamic, impressive place, ex exceptionally you know, accomplished, uh, high achieving in a very short period of time. And now they are dealing with some of the costs and consequences of their rapid development. 
Uh, they don't have a lot of options in terms of how to become more energy uh, self-sufficient or um, how to transition to alternative energies, uh, but it's certainly becoming a more prominent issue for them. Thanks. Ah, yeah, what was the other picture? Show me, um, oh, this was funny. In Jeju, you see ginger everywhere. I mean, they worship uh, the ginger plant. So this is literally like a seven foot high, um, I believe artificial piece of ginger. <laughs> that, um, but this was a ginger processing plant. They, you know, produce ginger in uh, a million different forms. Uh, and the island, uh, this is just, so the people in the traditional costumes, this is again in the shopping mall across from school. There's still, um, I think, a lot of charm and um, attention. If you wear traditional costume when you go to the national museums in Korea, you don't have to pay the entrance fee. Oh. So there are shops that allow you to rent these Korean dresses, <laughs> and you can go rent a, rent a costume and then go across the street to the museum and you don't pay your entrance fee. <laughs> so, yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> so, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to now invite the crop uh, of professors who actually gave a talk first last year, so that's why we put them at the end. It's not anything against the topics or countries or, or anything of the sort. I'd like to um, help you or ask you to help me welcome Professor uh, Mariali Lopez Santana, who will be talking about Spain, the politics of the reform party system. Let me just put this here. It's a better, I'm just holding. Okay. Hi everyone, and thank you for being here. So, this is just a picture from my younger self when I first joined uh, George Mason. Uh, that was, I first started doing research in Spain in 2003, and since then I've been there many times, but I think this was about 2008. And now this is my son. Last year I had the chance to go two times to Spain right before the election and then in the summer for a conference. So here you can see the contrast between the hams, the traditional Spain, and then the modern Spain because, you, of course, they don't eat with chopsticks, right? <laughs> so, so this is the, the idea. This is in the metro, actually, um, in terms of being an international city. So if you can show the next one, please. And um, here also another highlight of my year. Um, many of you know that I'm from Puerto Rico, and although I wasn't able to be there, of course I didn't sleep for weeks, right? <laughs> There's a Mimi going around. I'm not gonna go to sleep because Ricky, who was a uh, governor, my, my renown. So here, for example, you have Ricky Martin, who everyone knows, right? And he was a very important figure in terms of mobilization. This is my mom and my sister who made it to the newspaper. And, and this is the million people march that was huge, which in the end resulted in Ricky Rosselló, who was a governor, uh, being out, right? So I'm not going to really talk about this, but if you want to talk about it, I can refer to it later on. So, so this is Madrid. Uh, if you've been to Madrid, it's really amazing. This is the airport, Barajas. And this is just to give you a sense of the city. This is Madrid at 1 AM at, at, uh, and in the middle of the night, right? This is just people walking around uh, in the near, in the center of the city, just having a sense of, you know, people just go out to eat and so forth. And this is another part. So today what I want to talk about is a little bit about the specific changes that I experienced last year. As I said, I was in Madrid for, as a Vizinho scholar um, in spring, in the spring, and then in the summer I went for a conference. But to give you a sense of what is happening right now, I think it's really important to refer to the fact of the economic crisis in Spain. And at that point, I was actually a visiting scholar in Barcelona. And I was able, this is Madrid here, but you can really see the fact of the huge impact that the crisis had in Spain. Spain had the highest of not, I think, the second highest levels of unemployment in Spain in the crisis, and more specifically, the issue of unemployment rates for the youth. Here, for example, you can see 
it was almost 55% of the youth population was uni unemployed in 2012. So as a consequence of that, you see that this is the beginning of a whole process of mobilization that then has resulted in some political parties emerging as a consequence of the crisis. So to give you a sense, here you have the outcomes from the elections in Spain. And there are a few trends that you should observe, right? Spain was first um, a dictatorship until the 1970s, right? The end of the 1970s when Franco passed away. And initially the UCD was a socialist party that then became the PSOE, which is the socialist party, and then the PP, who is the popular party that is the conservative party, right? So, and the rest of up till here, more or less, right? These are very minor regional parties. So for the longest time, until 2004, mainly what you're talking about is that Spain was a two-party system in which the PSOE and the conservatives switched power at different points, right? And also what you can see here is that for the rest, most of the parties were you know, relatively small, especially these ones here. But then the crisis hit, right? And this, ha as I already showed you, this had a huge impact in Spain. I was living in Barcelona, and I experienced the beginning of it that first year. Uh, people just taking the streets, organizing, taking the central plaza in Barcelona, the youth really moving there for months. And then, as a consequence of that, what you see is that here you see, where is Podemos? Here Podemos is this party here. It was, a, it is a political party to the left of the socialist. And it's actually the, one of the founders is a Iglesias who is or was, I'm not sure, a political science professor. And then the other political party, Ciudadanos, you can see here, right? Um, this is a party that mainly emerged in Catalonia and in initially on Catalonia, right? And initially it didn't have a specific type of ideology because it was very new. It was more a kind of a nationalist party and then, but in the end, it turned out to be a conservative party to the right of the PP. And finally, the, which is a new phenomenon, Vox, is the radical right. And this is very unique because for the longest time many people say, well, Spain is really the outlier in Europe because it's the only country that didn't have a radical right party. And this was a conversation that I had many times when I was there in the spring, people trying to make sense of how, is it that the, how Vox was going to do. In general, they didn't do as well as, as many expected. They thought that there was a chance for Vox to actually win. But what we see here, and if you can show the next one, is that as a consequence of all these different political parties emerging after 2008, so basically what you have is PSOE, which is Socialist Party, the Conservative, which is Pepe, Partido Popular, uh, Ciudadanos, which is next to the left of the Socialist, and then Ciudadanos, which is to the right of Pepe, and in addition to that, Vox, which is a radical right. What has happened is that since 2008, Spain has really become a multi-party system, right? We're in a very short time, right, in about 10 years. But also as a consequence of that, because as you can see, these are, this is the outcome from the last election, which took place in April of 2019. What has happened is that none of the political parties have been able to get, have a majority, right? And as a consequence of that, the idea of how is that we're gonna form a coalition and with whom are we gonna form a coalition has been extremely complicated, right? So for example, just to give you an idea of what has happened in the last year and a half, right? The Pepe, which were the conservative party in, in May 9, 2018 was in power and therefore found guilty for corruption. 
and then Rajoy, who was a prime minister, stepped down. And in Spain, you have this mechanism, which is very unique, even in Europe, that you don't have to hold an election or have a vote of no confidence. What you can have is a motion of no confidence. And that meant that the PSOE, Julio Iglesias, who is this guy here, Pedro Sanchez, I mean, this guy, who is the leader and now the prime minister in Spain, right? They, they said, OK, because you, now you have the Pepe, it's not here anymore, or here, the Pepe, they don't have our confidence. But we have enough votes to be able to at least form a weak coalition and form a government, but a government that will stay in place for a short time, right? And then what, what happened is that they gain power, but then they call for elections, right? Because they cannot stay there because of that, right? They call for elections, but as a consequence of the election, what you find is here is the outcome that they were, were not able to form a coalition because even if the, the likelihood of forming a coalition, it was the PSOE with Podemos, which is uh, to the left, this new party, which is a new left, forming a coalition with the PSOE, they were never able to strike a deal. And that was what ha was happening the whole summer when I was there. I was talking to my friends. And at the, those days in the summer, you, every day, I was there for a week and a half, every day you hear on the news, they are meeting, but they cannot strike a deal. They want this type of concessions, but they cannot strike a deal. Uh, for example, uh, Podemos wanted to have certain type of welfare policies, which are the ones that I do uh, pass, but PSOE doesn't want to compromise, right? So in this back and forth, and also there were other coalitions that were also put on the table. For example, the possibility of PP and Ciudadanos forming a coalition, but the, the problem was that none of these coalitions also had an absolute majority to be able to go over the 50%. So what happened in the end is that they were not able to form a coalition, right? And the election took place in April. The whole summer they were bargaining. They were not able to strike a deal. So they submitted a proposal to the king, and the king said, well, they also voted. It didn't pass. They submitted a proposal. It didn't pass. So now what's going to happen is two weeks, three weeks from now, there are going to be elections in Spain, right? So in less than, what, April five, six months, right? Spain has had with two elections, right? It's going to have another one. And since last year, three elections, right? So if you think about, can you show the next one? This is really important, right? Because it has really shown how is it that when men, well now, as you can see in many places in Europe, right? In, in the United States, we also have this discussion. You know, if you, we move to, towards uh, proportional representation, what's going to happen, right? In Europe, what you see is that new parties are emerging, right? And as a consequence of that, increasingly it's becoming more difficult to form a coalitions, right? So as a consequence of that, also what you have is that governments are becoming increasingly more unstable in terms of length, right? And it, the Spain really shows, you know, in a year and a half, three elections, that's a lot, right? Also, um, it shows that the difficulties of having new parties that are to the left or to the right, forming compromises or creating a compromise with the mainstream parties or the casual parties. So that's also another complica complication. And also what I found very interesting, I was talking to my friends in Spain, and I was saying, well, you know, your father, your mother, yourself, you've been always voting for the same parties, right? So you knew you were from the left or to the right. So how is it that you're voting now? You know, how is, what is your voting behavior? And what, for example, my friend who is about my age, she, because she has information, she basically um, acts as a strategic voter, right? Based on the information that she has, she decides to vote 
for the person who is more likely or the political party that is more likely to win. However, the older generation, they're very set up in their own ways, right? So they're either from the PP or the PSOE, right? So that is really interesting in terms of whether voters, how is it that voters change, right? How is it that they learn when they have new political parties? And how is it that they act? Do they change their vote, right? My friend, for example, say, well, in the first shot, I vote for PSOE, but I know now that not, they're not going to win, so I'm going to vote differently, right? Or I'm going to vote in different ways. So I'm just going to stop here. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me have to mic you. Oh, no, actually, you, no mic, right? Is there a little thingy? Uh, there is. Uh, no, she means a uh, wireless. No. There's not a thing? There's uh, no clicker? No, no, no. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, oh. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite song from college days. <laughs> um, We have two more presentations. Uh, the next to last is by Professor Jo Marie, who joins us again after um, last year, actually. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure, yeah. And then uh, she will be addressing, Professor Bert uh, will be addressing researching and advocating for justice in post colonial conflict Central America. Post colonial conflict? It uh, is kind of post colonial it's, conflict. <laughs> uh, it's uh, a pleasure to have uh, you guys both again, and we hope others can also join us next year. Uh, please help me welcome. Thank you, Bassam. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, so I decided today to talk, last year I talked about my research uh, on war crimes trials in Guatemala. I think I focused on a specific trial that had just ended last year. So I thought this time I would reflect a little bit more about what I do as a researcher and as an activist, as someone who combines uh, their research into activism and their activism into research. If you could, so just to define what activist scholarship is, um, there's a whole very interesting discussion about activist scholarship, engaged scholarship. Uh, but those are, I think, the, the basic uh, uh, elements. So it's the rigorous engagement of research questions and methods to interrogate structures of systemic inequality with the idea that you're committing yourself to improving knowledge and understanding but also to public debates and public policy making to promote social change but it's not only that you're also engaged in very close collaboration with activists practitioners and others engaged in direct action on the research questions that you're involved in it's premised on critique, not just advocacy. Um, the idea there is that your research wants to understand why the world is the way it is, but it also wants to help change the world in favor of some presumably more progressive uh, and, and just outcome. Um, and especially important for activist scholarship is the idea that the people that you are conducting your research with, your research subjects, are not merely informances or data points, right? They're the people who are knowledgeable and empowered. They're knowledgeable and empowered participants in your research project. That's often difficult to achieve. Um, it's one of the reasons people like me, instead of becoming a, 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 a practitioner of one subject and then you carry it around the world and do comparative research, you tend to dive deep into one area. So for years, I did research on these issues in Peru. Uh, because of my work as a trial monitor and human rights a activist in Peru, I was invited to help set up a trial monitoring project in Guatemala in 2013 when that country was conducting the first ever criminal trial of a former head of state for genocide. So it was a very big deal. Um, and so I went to Guatemala to do that. 
And now I'm actually being, this is a, a very new thing, I'm being asked to help consult on developing a trial monitoring project in Colombia where the former president of Colombia, President Uribe, is under preliminary investigation. And Senator Ivan Cepeda reached out to me and because of my work in Peru and Guatemala, asked me if I would help them set up a trial monitoring project there. So I, I, I'm, I appreciate the ability to do that kind of research across, across um, countries. Um, so that's me right there, d diligently taking notes on the day of the verdict of the genocide trial. Um, I just love showing that picture because you can see how intent I and my other colleagues are in taking notes um, and then reporting back on, uh, on this trial. And I, when, I went to re when I went to Guatemala to do this project, this trial monitoring project, I worked as a volunteer for uh, the International Justice Monitor, which is an online web website created by Open Society Justice, Justice Initiative that primarily tracks international tribunals. So uh, Tanya was mentioning Croatia. One of the big international tribunals is the former International uh, Criminal Court for the former Yugoslavia, which is no longer in existence. It's wi winding down. It's almost shut down. Um, but uh, uh, the only trial in a national court that the IJM is monitoring is that of Guatemala. So it's a very unique uh, platform. So if you could click. So this is just some timeline about Guatemala that I'll just leave up there that you can look at. I'm not really going to talk about the background of Guatemala today. I did that last time. And I'm happy to do that again. Um, but I think it's important to just put up the, the idea here. Because what I want to get to, if you would go to the next phrase. So Guatemala had an internal armed conflict that in large part resulted from the intervention of 1954 in which the United States CIA overthrew a democratically elected government which ushered in a series of military governments and then a series of responses to that military government that resulted in this internal, the 36 year internal armed conflict with a huge social cost. 200,000 people dead, 45,000 people forcibly disappeared and so on. And I just wanna call your attention to these numbers here. 400 indigenous Mayan villages entirely wiped off the face of the earth. Eight out of 10 victims, indige indigenous Mayan people, which was one of the reasons the UN Commission for Hysterical, Historical Clarification determined that the military of, Guatem of Guatemala was responsible for genocide. Um, when the genocide trial was over, which again, I'm not gonna talk about the details of the trial. When that trial was over, I decided it would be interesting to sort of track what had happened to get Guatemala to the point that it was able to put the former dictator, the most powerful um, of the Guatemalan dictators, on trial and successfully convict him even though later on that conviction was overturned, I would argue illegally, but we'll talk about, we can talk about that later. So I developed this, tr is d this data collection project and I developed a database looking at the different trials that had preceded the genocide trial and that had come after. So you'll see here, here's the genocide trial that I observed and I since have observed, well I started again in 2016, so I've observed these four trials and reported on them hearing by hearing for the International Justice Monitor. I've also reported on um, cases that have indictments but that have not come to trial and I try to understand why that has happened. So there's this one case, which I don't have any images here of, unfortunately, of a, a military base, they dug up literally six, 565 bodies in the military base. Um, 145 of those victims were, were, had been identified using DNA evidence as victims of the, ar of the armed conflict. Um, in 2016, the preliminary judge determined there was sufficient, sufficient evidence to send eight of the 14 individuals who'd been arrested earlier that year to trial. But there have been a series of um, legal motions filed that have resulted in the stalling of that case. So I, I report on that case, but it's not actually one of the cases that's in trial. I just want to show you some images of some of the trials that I've observed. This is the genocide trial that I referred to. That's, uh, just go back for one second. This is Rios Montt here, and this is his uh, head of military intelligence. He was found, he was found not guilty. He was uh, convicted, as I said before. This is the day of the of the verdict, everybody's waiting for the verdict. And then the day uh, he's declared guilty. This is another trial that I observed um, of Maya Kekchi women 
who were, their husbands were killed by the military when local landowners called the military in and accused them of being guerrillas because they were demanding their right to re regain their land. They had nothing to do with guerrillas. Um, when their husbands were dead, the women were taken by soldiers, they were all raped, and then they were made to be the sexual and domestic slaves of the military for the next five to eight years, depending on the women. So many years later, this was in 19, between 1982 and 1988, these women brought their case to trial. Uh, here you can see the, the representatives of the Attorney General's office, They're the women's lawyers and the women's themselves. Um, and these two men were uh, ultimately convicted uh, of crimes against humanity uh, and for homicide and, and enforced disappearance. And they were sentenced to 140 to 240 years in prison. This is another case that I uh, observed last year. I, I talked about this last time, I think. Um, Emma Molina Tyson, she was a 21-year-old political activist in 1981. She was arrested at a military checkpoint, brutally tortured, gang raped by the military, uh, and miraculously she escaped. I was just with Emma this past week in the Netherlands for a series of workshops with victims from Uganda and Guatemala sharing experiences about truth-seeking, justice, reparations, and so forth. Um, it was wonderful to be with her. Um, she escaped. But in reprisal for her escape, her escape, the military went to her parents' house and kidnapped her 14-year-old brother, Marco Antonio, who has not been seen since. Uh, here, this is one of my most treasured images. I took this picture. This is Emma's, Emma and Marco Antonio's mother, who was present the day her son was disappeared. And she is pointing to the military official who was responsible for her son's disappearance. Um, so the four of the five military officials who were, prose who were con prosecuted in this case were convicted, including the former head of the army, which is this gentleman here, Benedicto Lucas Garcia, and the head of uh, military intelligence, Callejas y Callejas, who's also a known leader of organized crime in Guatemala. In fact, in 2003, the United States withdrew his visa um, because of his alleged involvement in drug trafficking. But they couldn't get him on organized crime, but they got him on human rights, which is ironic, because usually it works the other way around. Um, uh, if you could flip, uh, go back a second. Um, so over the spring break, um, well, er, since early this year, um, my time has been very focused on dealing with the backlash to all of these uh, criminal trials and convictions which is that the people who are affected by this have reorganized themselves and are trying to, is that my time up? Um, trying to um, stop these cases from continuing by passing an amnesty law. And so I've been doing a lot of um, advocacy work with victims to get the advocacy law, to prevent the amnesty law from being uh, approved. And I'll, I'll just leave it there because I think my time is up. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I will try to be as fast as possible. I'm, I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, do this right so that. So my name, wow, it's like I'm used to putting this on people, not on me, okay. Uh, my name is Bassam Haddad. I am going to be speaking today about a uh, topic that is actually, um, uh, that has a very uh, satirical title, uh, kind of like a game title, but it's actually very uh, serious. Uh, the title is a uh, fun travel game that uh, Trump and Israel would like to call annexation. Those of you who know about the topic and more and more people are learning about the topic in ways that are, that are actually astounding. So that so much so that uh, even uh, policy in the United States about the question of Israel-Palestine has been changing as a function not only of the uproar, global uproar, vis-a-vis uh, -vis what's going on in terms of the occupation, the illegal settlements, and what have you, but also among um, American jury 
who are actually beginning to feel that uh, uh, some of the leaders in Israel are actually pushing Israel to uh, the abyss or like in themselves endangering Israel. And that kind of adds to the critique that in the 1990s you would never hear or see, especially in the New York Times or the Washington Post. You, you cannot actually open the, the New York Times before 2003, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and then see critical articles. You do, you do see it in Israel, critical articles of policies that are, by, that are in violation of international law that even the United States does not support. The United States does not support the um, building of illegal settlements in the West Bank, okay? So, uh, however, in practice, uh, uh, not much is done uh, about it, if at all, beyond, beyond lip service. The reason I'm actually talking about this today is because every year since, 2000, since 1995, I traveled to Palestine, or every couple of years, every few years, depending on the time. And for the past about 24 years, 25 years, you, you feel that the news is, is, is tightening on, on people. I mean, we travel there, you just spend a very short period of time, but the, but the news is tightening. People are more and more suffocated as a function of the expansion of settlements, as a function of the uh, imposition of various uh, uh, road blockades, the creation of Jewish only or Israeli only, which is dubbed Jewish in the West Bank, because usually the people that uh, settle the West Bank from Israel do do it, uh, or many do it for religious reasons, not all, but it's, it's mostly uh, Israeli only uh, roads that connect settlements, which means that if it takes you seven minutes to go to school from your house after these roads are built, sometimes it will take you about two hours to get to your school every day, or an hour, or 40 minutes, or, or something of the sort. So uh, the, the, the trip that uh, I actually uh, uh, did uh, with family uh, saw the uh, unbelievable expansion of everything from roadblocks to barriers to walls uh, and then of course of late there is the uh, announcement of the annexation of the Golan Heights which we didn't go to that uh, that Israel actually embarked on and was blessed and supported by President Trump which is uh, uh, not in violation but in, in a sense it's different than what used to happen in the past. Presidents usually of the United States would not actually support something of the sort. So two things were supported, the creation of the, uh, or the move, move of the Israeli embassy or the American embassy to West Jerusalem, which is something that uh, all other presidents have not done, uh, and the blessing of the annexation of the Golan Heights, which is indisputably Syrian territory, because some people might dispute the question of Jerusalem, uh, even if uh, before 2000 or 1967, basically, uh, it was in what is called you know, the Palestinian territories. After 67, as a result of the war and the recapture of Jerusalem, it was split between East and West. East is Arab, West is uh, Israeli, uh, and uh, it has been officially annexed in 1980. So uh, these are two stories of annexation. The third story is, of course, the Golan Heights annexation that took place this year, 2019. Uh, but the other uh, issue that is of, of, of a lot more importance in so many ways to people living is the... Um, I, I, can, I can do this, yeah, I feel bad. I'm sorry that you had to... So the, the last uh, story, actually, of the um, uh, question of uh, annexation and uh, uh, land theft, land grab, call it what you will. I mean, people will try to sugarcoat things and have been for hundreds of years, whether it has to do with slavery, whether it has to do with sexism, the denial of rights for women or, or for people with particular sexual orientations. People try to sugarcoat it all the time. The point is, this sort of land grab has been going on in such a way that if you look at this map of the West Bank, you'll see that everything that is in blue is controlled by Israel, including uh, the settlements that are also in blue. And imagine like all the roads between the settlements, for the most part, are roads that you cannot get on unless you're Israeli. And that means that for every moment that you want to uh, move from one place to another, you have to contend with these roadblocks uh, as a person living supposedly in the place that you were born and your ancestors have lived for uh, for. A very long time. The, the fourth story beyond Jerusalem, the Golan Heights, and, and the question of the embassy is the Area C uh, Jordan Valley uh, zone that the Israelis called after 67 a, uh, uh, a security zone, 
which is considered here part of the West Bank, the breadbasket of, of Palestine, and it's completely under Israeli control, and is actually a, a place where uh, Palestinians' uh, population has decreased from about 200,000 to about 60,000, and restrictions on labor and everything else. And of course, the theft of resources from the land has been taking place for several decades. And this is the area right here. The only exception is Jericho, which is sort of in the middle of it, which I'll show you some images of. So this is basically the lay of the land. The question of annexation, of course, is not a funny or satirical question, but it is uh, so ridiculous that in the 21st century, things like like this, these violations happen in like plain sight, and it just keeps going. Um, and of course, people complain that oh, but Trump is a special president. Yeah, he made like he uh, sort of uh, went too far or uh, sort of uh, uh, accentuated uh, some of these problems. But Trump did not create them, right? Trump did not create them. In fact, Obama is known to be now the president that actually provided the most support to Israel among all presidents in the United States, uh, historically speaking, in terms of the financial support and pledges that were made under his period. So uh, it's important to recognize that, yes, Trump uh, is sort of like loud, and he actually makes uh, you know, some problematic uh, decisions that, that break with uh, tradition, but he is not the creator of the problematic policies. It's actually the Israeli state. Same thing with Netanyahu. People want to say, oh, Netanyahu is the problem. He's not the problem. He's just somebody who also accentuates bad decisions and actually pushes a particular line to satisfy his right-wing base. But, you know, Israel existed and uh, certainly these policies existed way before Netanyahu became even a, a, a young man. And they s continued from uh, several decades ago until today. But not, let's now go to some fun aspects. Uh, they're not fun, but you know, other aspects. This is uh, Jericho, actually. You could look at the Jordan Valley right behind, beyond this area. This is just, uh, let me see if, so this is just the uh, image of Jericho beyond which it's surrounded by, um, surrounded by uh, Area C, which is the Jordan Valley. This is an interesting uh, roundabout with a, uh, this is somewhat separate. There is a sign here that says, Al-Ghada bless him and Asab al-Din. Basically, people in Palestine, uh, Palestinians curse uh, religion and God so much. People in the Arab world do that, of course. Uh, if you're American and you live in America, you're like, oh, people in the, in the region do that? Yes, I mean, much more so than the United States. But especially in Palestine where life sucks, because of the occupation, because of land theft, because of all sorts of uh, discriminatory policies. So basically they're saying, uh, please stop cursing religion. It, uh, being <laughs> angry is not a reason. I mean, this is basically a response by the religious establishment to people cursing religion and so on. So I just took a picture of it uh, to, uh, to share. This is the wall separating basically Jerusalem from uh, Ramallah. And this is something that people have to contend with uh, almost uh, every day if they have to travel, even if they are Palestinians. So you have uh, this road that people have to cross after you park your car. You have to walk uh, all the way through all sorts of rabble and traffic in order to get to the other side. And of course, when you get there, the Palestinian Authority, which is a, uh, somewhat of a kleptocracy and corrupt, pol uh, corrupt government uh, or semi-government, which is not uh, autonomous actually, has have actually helped with uh, gotten help from the Israelis to build like an airport-like or a border-like crossing before there was nothing. And it's kind of like a double humiliation for people trying to cross uh, into uh, you know to see their uh, cousin or to see their uh, family members in, in East Jerusalem. East Jerusalem crossing from the uh, Ramallah uh, area, which is, of course, in the West Bank. And of course, people go through, uh, not just here, but everywhere, like everywhere in, in Palestine, if you want to move, you feel like your cattle. You feel like your cattle, and that's for several decades. Every day, the structural uh, repression. We're not, you're not talking just about home demolitions and the, and the killings that happen in, in raids and in wars, like on Gaza every few years. We're talking about daily life actually turning you into a form of cattle. This is uh, what you have to go through in many of these uh, areas. Every time you cross back or forth. This is my cue. I'll show you the rest very quickly. Uh, this is when we went to Jerusalem. 
And Naya was like, oh my God, you know, this is a problem here. Uh, and these are pictures of settlements from uh, Ramallah. Uh, this in particular right there in the middle right now. Not the ones ho over here. These are uh, Ramallah sort of uh, middle class, uh, upper middle class new housing. But it's actually over here. And you see them everywhere. I have tons of pictures and videos. But I'm just showing you the ones from just re this recent trip. Uh, so these are uh, settlements with walls uh, everywhere and these exist in uh, the West Bank to the tune of 600,000 people. Imagine in 1992-93 when the Oslo agreement that is heralded as a positive thing, it's a horrible deal. It's basically, you know, Bantu stands and apartheid legitimized by a desperate Palestinian authority that wanted to sign a deal so that the locals don't actually, uh, you know, sign a better deal and that brought the Arafat team and everyone else from Tunisia back to Palestine in 1993 because of that deal. That deal was signed when there were about 200,000 settlers. Now there's 600 plus thousand settlers in the West Bank, which makes you wonder what sort of two-state solution are we looking at if these realities on the ground are obstructing, uh, you know, a, a, a decent uh, equal rights uh, situation with two states that, uh, that live side by side. Um, and yeah, there's a lot to talk about, but I'll, I'll have to stop here and open it to everyone uh, and their uh, questions and uh, comments.